Hi, 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 Jake Steve here, the long-haired freaky dude. Today I'm going to review book one of Euclid's Elements, translated into English by Thomas L. Heath. Yes, my friends, I'm reviewing a collection of math. Why? Because it's influential. It's timeless. It's inspired so many great things. It has since been deemed the backbone of modern mathematics. More specifically, the foundation of our geometrical knowledge. And why just book one? Because there's 12 other books. And each takes a dreadfully long time to work through. So I figured each deserves its own overview slash analyst review thingy. If you've never read Euclid, you should know these things. He never uses numbers to prove his mathematical propositions. He proves everything solely through logic and analysis. In other words, everything in here can be proven using a straight edge and a compass. No need for those horrifically and theoretically inaccurate and inconsistent forms of measurement, such as rulers and protractors, to prove his problems. A nice thing about this is that all of his propositions can easily transcend across all number systems without conversion. So what is true in our base 10 system is also true in the binary system and the hexadecimal system without conversion. It's very convenient. Also, he states a few mathematical givens. And from these rules as they were, he can prove everything else within his books. They combine to form a few proofs, and then those proofs combine with other proofs to make even more complex proofs. It's very tricky web work to get around indeed, but ultimately a brilliant way of organizing this mathematical knowledge. Book one is strictly plain geometry, in other words, flat two-dimensional shapes. A lot of the things in this book are foundational, so that he can uh, create more complex proofs in later books. And at the beginning we are presented with 23 definitions of mathematical terms. A lot of these we are most likely familiar with, and uh, they don't need too much thought to ponder. Then there's also five postulates, which are essentially the axioms of math. The undisputable basis from which everything else comes. From which everything else can be proven. Essentially the Gaia of the mathematical world. And also we are given five common notions. These are very similar to the five other axioms. These are essentially like the five propositional axioms, except they lacked a certain constructive quality about them, but they are also axioms. And then from here, we're given 48 propositions. The bulk of the text. Everything else takes up just one page. The others, that's the other 47 or so pages. These are the problems which you must work through. These require much more thought and these require some sort of construction with a straight edge or a compass, and they also require a proof. I highly suggest working through these propositions and constructing them yourself. Simply reading them just won't work for this book. Uh, I'm gonna show you right here all of my work as I work through book one. It, it looks like insanity, but believe me, it's really rewarding to look back at these. I'll start with the last one because it's easy to flip through. So you can see I just worked through and drew them and essentially summarized the proofs. And I did that with every proposition. I didn't skip over a single proposition. So I definitely encourage you to do the same. It's really kind of hard to gather what it's, it's trying to prove without constructing your own visualization, without applying yourself to the proposition and proof, without working through the logic yourself. Plus, it's fun. Trust me, it is a lot of fun working through these. Whenever math isn't assigned, it is a lot funner. <laughs> there is nothing more rewarding than constructing a theoretically perfect equilateral triangle. And uh, in addition to that, most of the propositions are things which have been ingrained in our mind since high school geometry. These propositions, most likely almost all of them, will definitely be at least familiar to you. <laughs> <laughs> the proofs, however, uh, some of those might be forgotten. Or uh, perhaps, <laughs> or uh, perhaps they weren't forgotten. Perhaps they were never even taught. Perhaps there was nothing to forget. Uh, such was my case. I was never taught the proofs, unfortunately. Nonetheless, it was exhilarating to work through the careful methodical reasoning to reach the conclusion of each of these proofs. Now, since in high school we were most likely taught in a very numerical way, our minds are most likely preset 
to think in numbers, unfortunately. This new style of mathematical logical reasoning will most likely be completely new to a lot of us, and it will take a while to readjust your mind to thinking in such a way. Eventually, you'll be able to, to, to switch back and forth, think numerically and logically, but you'll definitely have to work through a few propositions, perhaps even a few books, before it's second nature. And, and believe me, it will become second nature with practice. Like anything, it requires practice to think in this way. It won't come overnight, believe me. Believe me, it will not. With that said, if this is your first time reading Euclid, going through the bo uh, first book, a few of the propositions will definitely be mind-numbing. For me, it was some of the later ones, like in the 30s and 40s, about parallelograms. Those were just, oh, those were so hard to get through. I was just, I was so dumb. But you'll eventually get into the flow, and doing these will be a breeze. Book one of the elements reads almost like a novel. Believe me, it's got plot complete with a very exciting climax. I almost don't want to say it because I feel like I'd be spoiling the fun, but I will anyway. Everything you work towards in this book, from proofs of parallels to areas of triangles and properties of angles, all built up to one epic conclusion, which is proving the Pythagorean theorem. <laughs> And then, finally, the Anti-Pythagorean Theorem. Yes, there's an Anti-Pythagorean Theorem too. Really, it's just switching a plus sign with a minus sign, but anyways. Fun stuff indeed. I mean, you start in Proposition 1, which is simply a construction of an equilateral triangle. It's very easy, you only need two circles and a line. It couldn't be simpler, Proposition 1. But then everything, everything builds up in a mind-numbing webwork to the ultimate conclusion to finding the ratio of a hypotenuse of a right triangle to its two legs. It was a rewarding conclusion to book one. I screamed with joy when it was done. Not only because I had endured a most intense 48 proof buildup to the Pythagorean theorem, but I had also finished my first book of Euclid. Not many people today have done that, unfortunately. It's a, it's a cool thing to think about. Now, oh, 12 more books. Even fewer have accomplished that. But anyways, it's just simply awesome understanding why these things are the way they are. So often we are taught that these things in geometry are true, but we're not taught why they're true. Teachers just don't want to incorporate it into their lesson plan, but I think it's a very essential thing to teach. I think it's perhaps more important that it exists, but why it exists. Not only is the why simply most bodacious, but with this knowledge of why comes an incomparable and unparalleled understanding of the proposition itself. Simply knowing the proposition is one thing, but once you know the why, you have a knowledge which is more apt to be able to apply that proposition to many, many other things in life. I mean, I remember when I was taught these propositions in school, the only thing I could apply them to was the math problems I was assigned. But now looking at them, I, I realize how many useful things these could be applied towards. It develops a working faculty within your brain. Not just some random fact drilled into your brain, but an actual function with moving parts. The why. It will take the proposition's existence and make it a machine, not just an image. So, my questions to you are these. If you've read Euclid before, please describe your experience whenever you read your first book of the elements. How did it feel, and how long did it take you to adjust your mind to thinking in Euclidean geometry? What importance does the Pythagorean theorem have in today's world, and more specifically in being able to prove it? And what sort of things can uh, any of the proofs in book one be applied to in today's world? Well, my friends, I thank you for watching. If you like this review, be sure to hit that awesome thumbs up button down below. And if you want to see reviews of Euclid's other books as I read through them, or other book reviews in general, or cooking tutorials, then might I suggest hitting the subscribe button and checking out my channel. If reading works like this are your cup of tea, then might I suggest checking out the Great Books Challenge right here. I'm Jake Steef, the long-haired freaky dude. Thank y'all for watching. See you in the next video.